Greetings and welcome. We now are back in AP English and our objective for the hour is to finish with the poetry and the poetic offerings of John Keats. I want to finish first of all with our observations regarding uh, Grecian Urn. Then I want to make a brief comment about Bright Star and then I'll finish with our observations on Ode to a Nightingale where we will try at least to juxtapose that poem to the great Skylark poem of, uh, of Robert Bish Shelley. So uh, let's go back now to Beauty is truth, truth, beauty, that's all you know on earth and all you need to know. Now, let's point out a couple of quick observations before we get to how do you reconcile the idea that the beautiful is not true. Let's point out at 3A right away. Keats knows exactly what he's doing in regards to Shakespeare's Hamlet, a play that he loved and memorized. The reality is that remember in the middle of Hamlet, Act 3, you will have Hamlet who will come to the front of the stage alone and say, to be or not to be, that is the question, whether it is noble than mine, except for the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, blah, blah, blah. Then Ophelia will come onto the stage and he'll call her nymph. She will break up with him. He will say, I never gave you that stuff. She says, what? Of course you gave me this stuff. And then he will look right at her and ask her, are you honest? To which she will respond, you bet I'm honest. No, not quite. What? What? What do you mean? Are you beautiful? Are you fair? Of course, she is beautiful or fair. That's important for the character playing Ophelia, the actor playing Ophelia. And she again will not say, yeah, of course I'm beautiful. Every guy in the kingdom knows I'm hot. No. Huh? What? Why do you ask that? To which then Hamlet will point out that in the world we live in, beautiful women never are honest. By very definition of their beauty, they're not honest. The two are mutually exclusive. Hamlet will say. In other words, beauty does not equal truth. Quite the opposite. Now, ugly equals truth, but not beautiful equals truth, okay? With that in mind now, Keats will play this game. He will give us a work of art. That's important, so let's start there. He will give us a work of art that speaks even though it's silent, okay? At the end of the, play, at the end of the poem. It speaks even though it's silent. And when it speaks, it says, beauty is truth, truth, beauty. Then Keats will follow that with a philosophic observation of epistemological importance, epistemology over relating to what you know. If I were to ask you fundamentally, what is it that you know and what is it that you need to know? Keats will say, there's really only one thing that you need to know, and it is this fact. Now, let's, let's ask this question, what is the key to unlock this idea, beauty is truth, truth, beauty, that's all you know on earth and all you need to know. And the answer won't surprise you when we return to Plato. So we're going to go back one more time, this won't shock you, and we got to go back to Republic. And when we go back to Republic, we're going to go back to the theory of what? We are going to go back to the theory of the forms. You're absolutely right. You'll remember, and I recommend that you do this now in your notes, just to place it as an iconic one more time in your brain. You'll remember that here above the first box in Plato's Republic, we're going to put the word images there, right? And then over here above this box, we are going to put the word forms, no doubt, but we're going to put concepts, ideas, correct? All right, which will allow for Emerson to call himself an idealist, and that's what he means when he calls himself an idealist, overrelated to ideas, okay? Here in this box, you'll remember, we'll put the beautiful face, and then here we'll put the term beauty itself, you'll recall, right? Okay? And on and on, you'll remember we played this game. So, for example, we can have Ruthie's tree in the, in the first box. That is to say, you can see touch, we won't get into the rest of it with Ruthie's tree. And then there is this thing that we will call nature with a capital N. Sometimes we'll refer to it as just simply energy, spirit, soul. Okay? Now, that's Platonism. That's fund fundamental Platonism. Keats, very aware of this idea. And now what he's going to do is play a game where he asks a really interesting question. And I don't know what I asked when I was lecturing Republic because I think I knew I was going to come to it now. And that is, where do you put works of art? Now that is an interesting question. Where do you put works of art? I know, let's just call it a Grecian urn, shall we? Now, obviously, you're going to have to put a Grecian urn in that first box. 
That's the whole point of all those lines that precede beauty is truth, truth, beauty. Notice what he does in the poem. He literally describes what you physically, remember, of or related to the five senses, right? What you physically can see on that vase, on that urn, right? I mean, he literally describes it. You have trees that are in spring and full bloom. They are, they are not going to lose their leaves. You have two lovers who are about to kiss. You have a, uh, uh, an entourage leaving the, uh, the little village with the heifer lowing at the skies. You've got all this stuff that you're actually physically seeing on the earth. All right? Question. We'll qualify this as a work of art. Later, Yeats will call it in Sailing to Byzantium, Monuments of Unaging Intellect. We'll get to that. But now the question is, what are you going to put in a second box? if you're playing Plato's game of the theory of the forms. Now that is an interesting question. What are you going to put here? We get it. Ruthie's tree correlates with the notion of nature or energy, right? Beautiful face correlates with the concept of beauty. On and on we could go in this regards. What are you going to put in the second box for works of art? Inspiration. See, now this becomes a really interesting Question for Keats. He'll spend a lot of time thinking about this from a Platonist perspective. What concept, what idea will allow for us to have any kind of correlate to works of art? Well, Keats will give it to us in his line, won't he? Notice that in this box, you cannot see, touch, taste these things, right? Here, for example, we will have value and some of the other kinds of terms, right? Notice he's going to give us two. Truth and beauty. Of course, in sheer Platonism, all of these concepts are interchangeable, aren't they? Right? That's part of Platonism. You can play that game back and forth where you can, you can designate the differences as being non-differences. There are differences in this box. These are a unified concept, and that ultimately he will call, does anyone remember? What's he call it in Republic? The what? Does anybody remember? You're right, Batson. He calls it the good. That's what he calls it. That's the best we have for a translation of it, the good. Yeah. Okay. Of course, Christian Platonists, like St. Augustine, will just drop one O. Right? They'll just drop one O. In other words, they'll just call it God, won't they? Okay, the same concept for, for St. Augustine playing the game. Right. So what is it that Keats will say at the end of this poem? If you listen closely to works of art... They will teach you something fundamental about reality. Namely, their creator, right, the, the artist that made the urn, goes away. The work of art ultimately can also go away, but much later, remember? When this generation shall waste away, right? Okay. Still the work of art is there, a friend to man to say, what? Beauty is truth. Truth, beauty. And then the most important word in the entire poem for Platonists is this word. Right? That's our epistemology. Correct? Notice what he says. That is all you know. Now we'll start reading closer. Do you see the words? On earth. And all you need to know. A distinction is going to be made between earth and somewhere else. The realm of the forms would be the Platonist way to talk of it. Show me a perfect triangle. Well, see, that's, you know, Plotinus already pointed this out, didn't he, right? And, of course, Pythagoras before him. You don't, you don't have perfect triangles. You don't have perfect squares. We can play the game of working with formula derived from the concept of a perfect triangle, right, where all of the angles will equal... 180 degrees, right? That is a concept. We're never going to find the perfect triangle, no matter how delicately we try to draw the silly thing. Where does the perfect triangle exist? Plato will say, in another world, right? Now, Plato was kind of, kind of sketchy on this. He said that actually floating out there in space somewhere, there's an ideal triangle, as are all these forms, you know, floating somewhere out there in space. Aristotle will come back and say, you know, we can kind of jettison that whole idea and still play the game. Keats is also going to play the game with us. Beauty is truth, truth, beauty. That's all you need to know on earth. This is a poetic way to say, every time you look at a work of art, 
Your appreciation for that work of art is actually an appreciation of what that work of art reminds you is most valuable. Beauty, truth. We could continue that list. Energy, love. Plato obviously is going to expand that energy or that list indefinitely, right? There's a whole bunch of these concepts, these ideas, all collectively understood as simply the good. Remember what the cave allegory was all about. The majority of people sitting chained in a cave are focused simply on beautiful bodies, Sports Illustrated swimsuit models and the like. They do not have the capacity to imagine what that Sports Illustrated swimsuit model will look like five or six months after she's dead under the ground when already the body begins to deteriorate. No one will be enamored of that body then, right? And yet there will still be this concept of beauty, this concept of love, this concept of truth, okay? And for Plato, as for Keats, the poet is the one who seeks to somehow identify that, as all artists are. So in other words, art is something more than just entertainment. Art is propedeutic instructional. It is a pointer towards what? It is a pointer towards those ideas in the second box. If you know the second box, you know enough to survive this world. That's Keats's point. Why would a guy dying of consumption take some comfort in that idea? Why? Why would this idea Right. All that he all that he can rely on is the search for something transcendent beyond the physical body. Outstanding, Miss Kennedy. That's right. And with that, in that regards, that's the only comfort he can derive. That's the only joy he can seek. Speaking of comfort and joy, let's go to the poem that he worked with at the very end of his life, Bright Star. I wish I had more time to be able to give to this, but I want to spend a little time with Nightingale. Keats will write this sonnet, and he loved writing these sonnets. He will write this sonnet right before he, right before he dies in, in Rome. Take a look at it with me. Bright star, would I were steadfast as thou art. Not in lone splendor hung aloft the night and watching with eternal lids apart like nature's patient sleepless eremite, the moving waters at their priest-like task of pure ablution round earth's human shores or gazing on the new soft fallen mask of snow upon the mountains and the moors. No, yet still steadfast, still unchangeable, pillowed upon my fair love's ripening breast to feel forever its soft fall and swell Awake forever in a sweet unrest, still, still to hear her tender taken breath, and so live ever, or else swoon to death. Now, let's just point out real quickly, he's playing a game in 3A. He's playing a game as uh, Shakespeare played the game in Sonnet 116. What am I talking about? What is the bright star to which he's referring here? Do you remember what Shakespeare said about that same star in Sonnet 116? Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remove to remove. Oh no, what does he say about it? It is what? Ever fixed mark that looks on tempest and is never shaken. It's the star to every wondering. I was waiting for someone to bark. Whose words are known, although his height be taken. Remember, what star was Shakespeare referencing in 116? It is the North Star. So Keats will play the same game. Look what he says. I wish I could be like the North Star, only he uses what word? to talk about it being unmovable. Steadfast, right? He says, I wish I could be steadfast just like the North Star. But then he turns right around and says, but not like the North Star. Really? Not like the North Star. No, not in, notice the word lone, lone splendor hung aloft the night and watching with eternal lids apart. I don't want to be like the North Star completely alone looking over the world, notice the things it is that the North Star gets to see, those priest-like waters, the um, snow on the mountain. I, I, he said, I don't, want, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be alone. How does he want to be like the North Star then? No, he says, yet still steadfast, still unchangeable, pillowed 
upon my fair love's ripening breast to feel forever its soft fall and swell, awake forever in a sweet unrest, still, still to hear the tender taken breath. Whoa, 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 where, is, where does he imagine he would like to be lying if he has to die? The darkest of ironies, of course, is that he will die in a few hours after he writes this poem. Where does he imagine he would like to be? This is an interesting 3B question. What for you would be the perfect place, physically, geographically, perfect place to die? What for you would be the best place to die? Again, some of you will say, dude, we're barely 20. Why would we be asking about the best place to die? Well, that's because you haven't coughed up blood, right? I mean, if you cough up blood, you got some sense of it all of a sudden. It's time to go bye-bye here pretty quick. He says, I wish I could be like the North Star, steadfast, unchangeable, but not alone. He would rather be where? He wants to be... Now, what do you make of this, Schreiber? He wants to be on his girl's, fair love's, ripening breast. What do you, what do you make of that? Where, where, physically, literally, where would he like to be? Where would he like his head to be? Lying where? On her chest as it rises and it falls. He says, I can think of no better place to be forever than to be right there. Notice the interesting uh, kind of juxtaposition of the drawing on the board behind me, right? I mean, Keats can write about beauty is truth, truth, beauty, but he also is very grounded to, for a guy, the perfect place to die is right on your girl's chest as she is breathing. He says, and live there forever, or swoon to death. If you got to go, he says, that's the perfect way to go. Finally, Keats knew he was dying as he got ready to write. So for him, the song of a bird is going to have a different cadence than it will maybe for Shelley. You will remember that I think, I think you will remember that I said, Shelley dies, Percy Bysshe Shelley dies in a tragic boating accident because of, ironically of all things, wind, out on the water. When his body is pulled out of the lake, in his pocket, he actually has a copy of the poetry of John Keats. Keats, at that point, was not famous. Shelley was already recognizing the poetry genius of, of his contemporary in Keats. Let's take a look now at Ode to a Nightingale. I want to just make a couple of observations before we get started. Notice the movement in this poem by parts, where we will move, first of all, from the envy of the happiness to the longevity of the nightingale, the bird of nighttime that we'll sing. This poem makes more sense when you understand that Keats is dealing with the when I have fears that I may cease to be idea. Some of these poems will come back to have powerful cadence for you much later in your life as, of course, you begin that process of aging. Let's take a look at what Keats has to say, Ode to a Nightingale. My heart aches, and a drowsy numbness pains my sense, as though of hemlock I had drunk, or emptied some dull opiate to the drains one minute past and lengthy wards had sunk. Tis not through envy of thy happy lot, but being too happy in thine happiness, that thou light-winged dryad of the trees in some melodious plot of breach and green and shadows numberless, singest of summer in full-throated ease. O oh, for a draught of vintage that hath been cooled a long age in the deep-delved earth, tasting of floral in the country green dance and provincial song in sunburnt mirth, Oh, for a beaker full of the warm south, full of the true, the blushful hippocrine, where beaded bubbles winking in the brim and purple-stained mouth, that I might drink and leave the world unseen and with thee fade away into the forest dim. Fade far away, dissolve, and quite forget what thou among the lees hast never known. The weariness, the fever, and the fret here, where men sit and hear each other groan, 
where palsy shakes a few sad last gray hairs, where youth grows pale and scepter thin and dies. I wonder who he's thinking about there. Where but to think is to be full of sorrow and laden-eyed despairs, where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes or new love pine at them beyond tomorrow. Away, away, for I will fly to thee, not charited by Bacchus and his parts, but on the wingless wings of poesy, though the dull brain perplexes and retards already with thee, tender is the night. And happily the queen moon is on her throne, clustered around by all her starry fays, and here there is no light, save what from heaven is which with the breezes blown, the verdurous glooms and winding mossy ways. I cannot see what flowers are at my feet. It's dark. Nor what soft incense hangs upon the boughs, but in embalmed darkness guess each sweet, wherewith the seasonable moth endows the grass, the thicket, and the fruit tree wild, white hawthorn, and the pastoral eglantine, fast fading violets covered up in leaves, and mid May's eldest child, the coming musk rose, full of dewy wine, the murmurous haunt of flies on summer eaves. Darkling, I listen, and for many a time I've been half in love with easeful death, called him soft names and many amused rhyme to take into the air my quiet breath. Now more than ever seems it rich to die, to cease upon the midnight with no pain, while thou art pouring forth thy soul abroad in such an ecstasy. Still wouldst thou sing, and I have ears in vain, to the high requiem become a sod. Thou wast not born for death, immortal birth. No hungry generations tread thee down. The voice I hear this passing night was heard in ancient days by emperor and clown. Perhaps the self-same song that found a path through the sad heart of Ruth when sick for home she stood in tears amid the alien corn, the same that oft times hath charmed music casements opening on the foam of perilous seas and fairy lands forlorn. Forlorn. The very word is like a bell to toll me back from thee to my soul self. Adieu. The fancy cannot cheat so well as she is feigned to do, deceiving elf. Adieu. Adieu. Thy plaintive anthem fades past the near meadows, over the still stream, up the hillside, and now it's buried deep in the next valley glades. Was it a vision or a waking dream? Fled is that music. Do I wake or sleep? Of course, um, the reference to Ruth is one only appreciated if one has read the Judeo-Christian Old Testament. The next time you're sitting at church, take out a Bible sitting next to you and open to that classic book of Ruth to have a really great love story told for you. Keats will play the game of what it means to leave, but to be sad about leaving. Because he's young, he obviously doesn't feel like he's accomplished everything that he wants to accomplish. And so in everything that's happening in his life, he immediately equates it with the fact that soon he knows he must die, like a sick eagle looking at the sky, to quote an earlier poem. And so, for example, he will hear the song of a nightingale, and instead of, like Shelley, writing a poem that's a tribute or an anthem to the song, he will rather... Think about the way that the song of the bird reminds him of his own poetic song and how soon it must go fly away. Adieu. In the same way that the bird will soon fly away. Leaving him to wonder if he's alive or if he is dead. Of course, when you have terminal illness, you're kind of aware that you're in the half-light, aren't you? Between being alive and dead. Of course, back to our board one more time. If you buy into this notion... You understand it's only a body that's going to go anyway. There isn't anything in that second box that can be destroyed. And from that, Keats maybe drew, drew some comfort. Maybe. It's hard to say.